and record. All right, I'm going to put this uh, link in the in the chat if anyone wants to share it to if you want to share it to Discord, uh, Myron. This is a live stream link. People don't know, don't have to log in now. All right. Hey, welcome everyone. Um, let me add Myron here. Hey, welcome everyone to the uh, to our first ever Unreal Florida hurricane party, so to speak. We literally are waiting for Hurricane Nicole to arrive. No, no relation to our Nicole from Unreal Florida. Um, it's going to arrive, I think, in the next few hours. So. Uh, if you hear some uh, wind or crashing trees, you'll know what it is. Maybe it may, or it could be maybe Eric's uh, trailers, but uh, um, that's what's going on here. So um, we are live streaming and recording this for people who are still doing hurricane preparation. So, um, but people who missed this, uh, we're about to see Eric in person on Saturday, which he's going to go into. He's doing an actual screening of his uh, film. So. Uh, before we start, let me, let's uh, play Eric's uh, trailers here. Let me share screen. All right, so you guys see the screen? Yeah. All right, great. Well, here's a memory for you. We either fold or we double down. I want you to have the world, Emma. But please, not kids. I'll do anything else you want. Go to. It is a plague that Cupid will impose from my neglect of his almighty dreadful little might. Hey. Oh, don't be afraid. I'm just a friendly officer here with some friendly advice. <laughs> Make dust our people, and with rainy eyes write sorrow upon the bosom of the earth. I suppose my books fell short of their final chapters, and even my verses languished uncompleted. Out here in the middle of nowhere, we didn't even speak the language. Find a guy to break your heart. Water real still. Fog hanging low. I became the moon and the ship in the dim starred sky. It belonged. impressive stuff very good stuff very great good yeah so um let's see if i'll stop yeah so uh, let's introduce our speaker for today uh eric bear um eric is visiting us all the way from austin texas and uh he's here for the fort lauderdale international film festival so that's where you can meet him in person on saturday so we'll go into that in in a bit so eric i'll give the floor to you all right well, thanks for having me here. It's uh, 
quite uh, quite cool to connect up with this local community. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and and my background, um, and I can talk some about this this series, how we made it, um, and uh, you know, open it up to conversation because you know what's interesting to me is connecting with you guys, what you're up to. Um, share what we've learned in our process. And then, um, you know, we've got, uh, I can share, we've got a discount code just for this group to be able to go to the, the, the world premiere uh, and That's reception. That's awesome. It's normally $500 we're getting for $5. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's, um, it's not that much, but, um, but the discount is $5 instead of $18. And it includes a reception. So just the food is worth it not just this awesome film. Um, I say it's a film, it's a really series. So, uh, so I'm Eric Bear, and I'm an actor and, uh, and I'm a writer and I'm a producer and, uh, and I lived a past life as an entrepreneur. Um, I try, I'm trying to put it in the past, but you know, as, as a creator of companies and a creator of possibilities, you can never really stop. It just keeps happening. It's kind of a blessing and a curse. And um, so I grew up in New York City and uh, and I was in uh, musical theater and, you know, kind of like singing, dancing, doing the whole thing. And the first film I was in was a, a Woody Allen film called Annie Hall. And I don't know if any of you are uh, old enough here to remember Annie Hall. Um, we shot it in 1975. I was seven years old. And, and I had this, this line, which kind of became a meme, which you can look it up. I said, I used to be a heroin addict, but now I'm a methadone addict. And I didn't know what it meant. My mom wouldn't even tell me what it meant because she knew I'd ham it up and ruin it. Um, so <laughs> I remember that scene. You were the kid. In the I am that kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, that's one of my favorite parts of the movie. <laughs> no, it's so good. You know, I mean, it's funny because you could search for it on the web and you find pictures of me as a kid. And, uh, you know, for a while I was on Pinterest with T-shirts and mugs and stuff, which is so ridiculous. But um, and, this, you know, we, we didn't call them memes back then, you know, like, but uh, but it really is. So. Um, that's what got me into the Screen Actors Guild, uh, which is now, you know, SAG-AFTRA. The two guilds came together. And um, when, uh, when I was 20, I had this uh, jazz dance teacher from Harlem who advised me not to go into the performing arts because as a white male, privileged, happy-go-lucky kid, I didn't know suffering, so there's nothing for me to express. Um, and a lot of people criticize her for having said that, but it's not the reason I didn't go into it. I went, I didn't, I, you know, I, I went into tech for other reasons. It was, just, it was a passion and it's what I was good at. And, um, and I can make really good money doing that. Um, but it's when I turned 40 and then I got close to 50 that I remembered her saying that. And I was like, wow, I know suffering. I have a partner who's a cancer survivor. I've raised two special needs kids from you know out of orphanages in china who've grown up to be fabulous adults you know um i've made lots of money i've lost lots of money i've hired lots of people i've had to let go of a lot of people and take away their security and their you know they're, they're paying their mortgage um you know really painful things to have gone through um and and i've been married for about 30 years so um and I don't say that because it's pain. I say that because it's life experience. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, like, it's, oh. it's, it's, it's a real marriage, not a Hollywood marriage. So when we had our pre-call, he's literally like texting his wife <laughs> and everything. I'm like, that's a, that's a close marriage there. Yeah, it's great. It's the, it's the best thing. Um, and so, you know, I decided to, when I sold my last company to come back to what I love. So I've, so I've run a bunch of startups um, had some successful exits. I've also held executive positions in very large companies. I ran the tablet PC user experience team at Microsoft of all crazy things to have done. I ran um, uh, mail, messenger, photos, personals, set top and mobile for Yahoo uh, user experience teams. Um, and uh, I've got over 100 patents and patent applications internationally. 
um, all user experience things, what make technology um, in, you know, better and more meaningful, easier for people to use. Um, uh, I've, I've licensed my inventions to all the major motion picture studios in the United States and all the top consumer electronics companies in the world. Um, you know, uh, some I can name, some I can't name, but if you can think of them, then I've probably done a deal with them. And um, some things that, you know, you might use in everyday life that you might recognize um, that are inventions of mine. Um, if any of you are a, watched The Matrix on DVD when it first came out in 1999, you could be watching the film and in the corner was a little white rabbit. And if you could hit your remote when the white rabbit came up, the film would pause and then you could uh, play some behind the scenes, some like the making of. And when you were done watching that little vignette, the movie would magically pick up right where it left off and continue. And I call that seamless expansion. I invented that in 1994, before DVD, before TiVo. You know, this is well before the iPhone, not that interactive video is happening on the iPhone so much, but just kind of a frame of reference for where we are in history with an invention like that. Um, you know, I, I had approached Microsoft early on with that and they said, that's ridiculous. No, that'll never work. It would require storage on a TV and that's not going to happen. Um, so that's something that, you know, you might use. It works today on many platforms, certainly most Blu-ray discs, if anyone even uses those anymore. But, um, you know, we see it on, uh, on Amazon Prime where you can pause the movie. Now you can get to ancillary content and then pick up right where you left off. Um, and that's through a company of mine called Monkey Media. Um, we used to be homed at monkey.com, but someone bought monkey.com from us for a ridiculous amount of money. So we were now at monkey.media. Mm -hmm. um, so you can check that out. The latest invention series uh, through Monkey Media is a solution to motion sickness in virtual reality. Um, it turns out that the, the problem with the biology of sickness in VR is not a hardware issue. It's a wetware issue. And there's been many people trying to solve this by increasing the frame rates, increasing the resolution, um, all these sorts of things. But the problem is very simple. And we came up with a solution kind of accidentally. Um, I had been working on uh, navigating a 3D videoscape uh, as a prototype for a museum exhibit and I and wrote it on an iPad. I, I wrote all the 3D primitives um, by hand. This was kind of before there were great tools for doing 3D and I, you know, wrote software to map video onto, a sh onto shapes in 3D. It was like, I, I can't even, I would never be able to replicate the code. but. Um, when the rift came out i was like hey i wonder can we apply this to vr you know because i had done it on an ipad navigating and um my experience of the rift when it first came out was that um it made me feel pretty sick using the keyboard to navigate and i didn't know why um but the moment i mapped my code into the system I can navigate hands-free. So the way it works is you lean in the direction you want to go. So you want to move forwards, you lean forwards. You want to go backwards, you lean backwards. You want to go straight sideways, you lean to the side or to the other side. It's just really simple. Like there's no learning because it's based on the way people move in the real world. When you're walking around the real world, you're leaning forward a little bit. If you were to like look at a building, really tall building, you'd look up at it and you'd start to move backwards when you're looking up. So we just kind of modeled it based on the way people work in the world. And um, so when I mapped those uh, primitives into the rift space to move around, didn't feel sick. And I was like, that's weird. Went back to the keyboard, felt sick again. Went back and forth each time, sick, not sick, sick, not sick, it was predictable and uh, talked to a friend of mine who's actually the drummer in my band, who's an ENT surgeon. 
it's kind of funny. The guy who's the drummer in my band actually works on the smallest bones in the body. Um, and he was like, yeah, there's a, there's a thing called vection where, uh, if the, the, your inner ear fluids and what you're seeing in your eyes out of sync, the message goes from your brain to your stomach to feel sick. So we had, we short circuited that by causing the fluids in your ear to match the change in visual fields coming from the lenses. It's like super simple. So we've got about 10 patents on that, um, which is pretty cool. We're still a little bit ahead of the game um, time-wise, you know, in terms of people being ready. So there's some background, right? So I did this stuff, ran these companies, made a bunch of money, sold my last company and decided I don't want to run tech companies anymore. Um, tired of managing engineers and uh, raising money and um, went back to conservatory to kind of re get back into acting. And, and, and what's significant about the school that I went to, the Carol Hickey Acting Studio in Austin, Texas, um, was that Carol's approach was about feeling in the body authentically what the character's feeling. So it's not about, I'm gonna show you what happy looks like, I'm gonna show you what sad looks like, it's the moment you start paying attention to what your body's doing or what your face is doing, you're not in it. It's not real. So that yeah, that's definitely something we want to pick up on. It's like we, like we talked about during our pre-call, you know, a lot of people who attend or, you know, like they're, they're actually not techies. They're more creatives. Right. Yeah. I think having uh, maybe talking about your journey as an actor. Yeah. And also how regular actors like Paul Bronstein on the call right now, he's a metaverse guy, but he also, was an actor or he went to acting yeah. school. And so Crazy. basically how do you act for promotion capture? How do you act for video games and these type of things? Yeah. So, so definitely I, I did pick up on that. Like when you're doing the trailers, you know, one scene you're leaning back with the face yeah. wear rig and you're, you're just matching the emotions of how you're supposed to be in the, uh, right. And even though you didn't have to, I felt like that was part of your acting process. So, uh, Oh, well, so there's two yeah. things. Yeah. So let me talk about that. Sure. There's a couple, there's a couple of things like, one is about the, there's the work on the face and then there's the work on the body. So as a, you know, trained for uh, film and TV, you know, it's different working for camera than working for stage in, in some ways, right? For stage, you've got to be concerned with the last row being able to see what you're doing. What's interesting to me is the close shot, you know, the kind of the frame that we're in here, right? Where you can have feelings. <laughs> And those expressions are internal. They're memories of you as the character. And um, uh, there's some of us actors who are like realm benders. We uh, phase shift between realities. And uh, for me, it's like the loving kindness meditation. You know, if you know and you know or experience in, in Buddhism, where you uh, take take on and become in the bodies of the, those that you love, as well as those that are, are in conflict, um, because we're not separate from each other. And so there's a similarity to me in being one with others uh, and reading a script and then becoming the character. Because once I've read a script and I've be become that character, it's like I always was them and I always will be. And the, the joys and the sadnesses will always be with me for for each of those characters and so what's interesting what was interesting about this project was it was a test of metahumans um there were a number of things that we were testing and uh and so i'm going to loop to the motivation and then come back to the performance approach both in terms of the emotional approach the face as well as the body, you know, which which you saw there in the in the trailer, um, and we could watch it again once we've talked about it. You know, kind of yeah. see like, oh, what do we see going on there? So, yeah, I'm trying to pull up over the parts of your website to show, but uh, it's a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so the hurricanes so, messing up our internet right now. Okay, yeah, and you're doing the broadcast, so I could yeah. share it too. We could, yeah, that's, yeah that'd be great. Yeah, we do that. So, as well. so look, we were in quarantine, and and I just completed three years of work in going back to school to learn how to not act and just be present as a human being. Um, Cause that's kind of the trick. And, and, and yet we couldn't be on set 
there was no shooting film. Um, and I was looking for creative collaboration and connection with people. Um, and I got connected up with Damian Gordon. He moderates the Motion Capture Society group on Facebook. Um, he was at DreamWorks at the time. And he connected me up with some other people. He connected me up with Terry Notary, who built me uh, a pair of uh, quadruped arms, you know, fit to my body size. Um, so I could do primate work and quadruped work. Um, he connected me up with the folks at Xsense, which is now Movella, the um, accelerometer based suits and Manus, who makes these wonderful gloves and the folks at Facewear who make great helmets. Um, and uh, Babak Baheshti at, at Standard Deviation is making another helmet. Um, yeah, we got there. Like, we need to have you on a meetup for each one of those. Like, we right? like, Myron and Paul were talking about uh, excess today on email thread, and we'd had the product manager from, from uh, Facewear at our yeah. sci fi virtual productions Unreal Engine meetup. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so, we, so I can talk about all that stuff. You know, so he hooked me up with them, and, um, you know, I, I, I ended up doing a bunch of tutorials on primate work because I was really interested in that um, uh, as a quadruped. And that was interesting to those companies because they hadn't, they'd never used the suit or calibrated it for four-legged um, um, locomotion. Uh, and the, you know, I had to rewire the glove, the, the arms and the gloves to work with arm extensions so that it would trick the angles to be proper distances, you know, and, and so I have some tutorials on that that's on my social media and I can point you to that to you guys. So it became a little bit of an influencer kind of unintentionally just because I was following my interests and it was interesting to other people and face where, so MetaHumans came out, beautiful, you know, 3D models, uh, photorealistic, um, and Facewear approached me. They said, "Hey, can you help? You know, promote this with your, your. You're an actor in this space. Not many people in motion capture society. You know, motion capture, virtual production professionals are actors doing this. But I was kind of in the left brain, right brain combo. Right? I was like a tech person and an emotional person. I could do this approach. And I said, "Look, I don't know." if they're going to work. They look beautiful when they're kind of craftily presented to us and no one's saying anything or actually feeling feelings. Um, but, um, but I could do a test and we'll see if it works. And I was like, oh, you know, I'll pull together some monologues. I'll do some things with some different dialects because each dialect, different kind of face, muscle, movement, the tongue is in a different position, the chin's in a different position. Um, I'll use some different kind of racial characteristics um, and different emotional characters, you know, do something angry, something sad, something moving, something frustrated, you know. So are you, are you acting, do you rehearse act with the, with the rig on you or do you, uh, um, or do you do it on your own as an actor and then put the rig on separate? Is like, what, what, at what point do you, do you add the technology? Yeah. So I don't really rehearse act. Okay. That's not a thing in my practice. For me, the homework is seeing the world. The homework is remembering the history uh, all the backstory and those things so that when I'm now in the world and I'm speaking, it becomes, you know, it's, it's, it has to occur like it's occurring for the first time. That so awesome. you're, you're like, you're like the Clint, Clint Eastwood uh, school of uh, directing. It's awesome. You, uh, like one, so I, one, he's a one, one take, one, one take, take or two takes. If there was a technical screw up. Yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that, practicing with people, but not, you know, not fully embodying it because it needs to stay fresh. And what's most important is not what's occurring at the moment. What's most important is actually what's being activated emotionally from the history. Um, so that's the, that's the most important homework. Now, so wearing the gear can be really distracting, right? Um, and, you know, we're, we're in, a, in, a, in an empty volume, 
right? There's not much there as a cue. Now we do have to have some props, you know, that are the right shape, whether we've got a sword or a gun or a counter that gets leaned on, that's exactly the right height, or there's a mirror that I need to, you know, wipe the fog off of. We need to get the distances just right. So there's a block out in Unreal Engine that takes those physical, or there's a door you need to grab. You need to know where the handle is, what's the angle of rotation and things like that. Um, and so, so look, so what I did was I said, I will uh, do a test. And the problem is as an entrepreneur, a test turns into a thing. So I put out a call for directors to do 10 uh, vignettes. And we were just gonna release these on, on, on YouTube for free. Cause it was like, it's an experiment. I got 10 of some of the best animators in Unreal Engine to come on and really diverse. We've got, you know, two African-American directors, two women directors, um, uh, two Latinx directors. We've got a couple of queer producers. We've got topics ranging all over the place. Um, two of the episodes are Shakespeare. There's a Tennessee Williams, uh, a Eugene O'Neill, and six of the episodes we we wrote ourselves. Um, so and everybody's got episodes right here, right? The the uh, yeah, there's ten episodes. They're all about five minutes. Some are a little bit longer. Um, and uh, multiple actors in each one. Uh, so I've got scene partners. There's one episode where I play against myself as a father and a son. Um, and, uh, or if we go to hyperwatt.com, we get a better view sure. of, uh, of those at the, you know, we just scroll to the bottom of hyperwatt.com. Um, you can see the 10 episodes there. Um, so we started making these. And when, when we first shot, I was I was in the middle of filming a, a, a TV series called 1883. It's a prequel to uh, Yellowstone uh, with Sam Elliott, and and I had a beard for that. So we got really poor quality because I couldn't shave the beard in between uh, in between episodes. Um, but Fika Entertainment helped us. They did they did the processing and face work for us from Australia, um, and that allowed us to do pre visualization. We got to build out the sets, build out the environments, work with this first kind of take of the of the performances, the costumes, lighting, all of that um, through the fall of 2021. And then when I was done shooting 1883, I was able to shave and then we could go back into the volume and reshoot everything um, and just drop in brand new performances. Uh, uh, part of the challenge is that we were using some other scripts that we couldn't get the rights to and had to rewrite the scripts, but keep the environments, keep the costumes, keep the lighting and keep the arc, but brand new script and brand new characters. Uh, uh, and uh, so we shot over 10 days or 10 episodes. Uh, Corey Williams, uh, who you may know from, you know, from the community was our, our motion capture director. He directed two of the episodes too. Uh, Luke Hill came down to be motion capture operator. Um, and it was just the two of them on set. My son came in as a grip, helped us do some movement of some, some things. And, uh, and all the, all the other directors were remote over zoom. So we had set up, you know, a monitor so they could see us and we could see them and they could direct the performance uh, from wherever they were, whether it was Vancouver or LA or, you know, um, uh, Virginia or wherever. Well, so it's like an in inception shoe. It was a virtual production within a virtual production. Exactly. It was kind so, of the uh, meta meta. Yeah. So let's, uh, let, let's, let's introduce Myron and uh, I think Myron's going to uh, take over uh, the, uh, questioning now about we'll get into now we'll get into the actual unreal aspect and metahumans and uh, you know the actual hands-on aspect of uh, of creating something in unreal engine then we'll move to paul bronstein who does a lot of metaverse work here in miami and he's also a went to acting school as well and so he'll he'll come on and ask you questions right after myron Great. so uh myron go ahead You're, the floor is yours Absolutely. Thanks. Um, so a couple of questions. I mean, I noticed you use the accents a lot. You use the manus gloves and 
fun enough, just last week I was speaking to the people over at Accents and they were telling me how great the tools are. And of course, you know, there's plenty of videos and yours are definitely no exception in showing how good the technology is. Yeah. Um, the first question I have for you is, what would you say were the technical challenges at first that you had to overcome in order to accurately capture the, you know, the emotion, the performance for, uh, you know, making sure that it represented exactly what you were feeling? Yeah, so, uh, so a couple of things. One is the block out of the volume for the, the particular scenes. So we need to know the dimensions of the space, where the doors and the counters, if things are gonna be placed, where the eye line is to a scene partner. There were some, some scenes where I had another actor with me simultaneously, others where I played both characters and I'd need to know where to look, right? Mm -hmm. So that had to be blocked out in Unreal and then mapped to the real volume and put in that space. Um, and th there's one episode where I play a father and son in uh, driving in a car. So we are recorded the father who speaks more. And, and then we had a, a picture of the son that I could look at. And then I would move over to the other chair as a son and we put an iPad where the father was and we played back the video of the recording so that I could emotionally respond as the son to the, to the performance, right? So there's just kind of the, me the mechanics of that. Um, uh, and some of those props, you know, needed to, to have motion in them. There's one scene and, and, and you know, we'll come back and we'll see this, uh, where we're in a rowboat and, uh, you know, you could animate the body to do things, but it would never look right if it didn't come off of a real body. So we built a structure that was effectively a rowboat, right? It was like a bookcase balanced on top of a heavyweight bag, you know, with handles and oars going through, uh, uh, you know, metal hangers, you know, and, um, and Corey and my son, Steven would rock this structure so that my scene partner and I would be, you know, actually moved our bodies. Like we didn't Star Trek it. We weren't, you know, creating fake movement. We were just, you know, the boat would move and, and our bodies would move and X sense just picks it up directly. So you would see it and you'd put those characters into the boat and the boat had a sensor on it. So we translated the actual movement from that surface directly to the boat object and then our bodies directly into it. And it was like, we were in real water, you know, it was like actually happening. Or I was on a horse in the Shakespeare scene. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we'd looked at videos of the gate of a horse. And then I'm sitting up on top of this gymnastics mat with stirrups made out of uh, rings. And, you know, Corey's rocking this thing like a horse, which caused my body, you know, to naturally move. So we, we used natural movement to cause organic responses in the body, which Xsense just took, and it goes dropped straight in. You know, there's always a little bit of cleanup of things. You know, um, you, you get some intersection of an arm goes through a leg or two hands kind of go through each other, you know, stupid stuff like that that's pretty easy to fix. Um, so that's the, um, you know, there's some cleanup, but that gives a sense of kind of how we set it up to, to be able to do it. And, you know, the, the real test for us was like, we knew we could do all the physical things. And some of those things that had never been done, like a boat with an iPhone, you know, kind of glued to the boat to measure its movement so that it would sync up and go straight live streamed into, into, um, you know, Unreal Engine. But um, we didn't know if the faces would convey. And so it was really important to me to not add any layer of paying attention to that, but just feel the feelings. And then we would come back later and say, hey, does, how does that read? You know, and then it just ended up looking so good to us. So we're like, we can't give this away for free. We need to um, take this to film festivals and then shop it to a streaming service and get to the widest audience possible. Makes sense. Um, with that said, how comfortable would you feel, or Barry said, how confident would you feel given a live performance? So imagine yourself and other actors being behind the stage or some stage and 
you're giving a live performance to a live audience whether it's remotely or maybe it's projected on a screen you know how how confident would you feel with this technology to actually give a live performance well i've done it i've actually done oh. that i um you know my enthusiasm for quadrupeds and and primates is, is not just in the performance space but i'm actually an animal activist and and um you know work towards the safety of of monkeys and and apes or around the world and and organization that I work with is called Born Free. There's Born Free in Europe and Born Free USA. And pretty close to my home, just a few hours away, we have the largest primate sanctuary in the United States. We've got over 500 monkeys there. And we were doing a fundraiser and they asked me to MC it. And I said, tell you what, we've got mostly Japanese macaques at the, uh, at the sanctuary. So I'm gonna live MC this as a macaque. And so, so we did, uh, uh, I had the suit, I had the helmet and ran it through Unreal Engine, through OBS, right into Zoom as the MC, as a monkey. Oh, that's awesome. And would you say there were any technical hiccups at all or it was all pretty much nearly flawless? Oh, it's never flawless. It was total, it was, it was like terribly scary. Um, <laughs> You know, um, one of the things that happened then, which has been fixed since then, was if you sat still. So the thing with an inertial suit is that it didn't have um, a fixed frame of reference to the volume, right? So if you're moving, it's fine because it's constantly recalibrating. But if you sit still, you end up with drift. So over the course of this fundraiser, I was like, Grr sliding over and I had to keep moving my chair because I didn't have like I couldn't reach over and you know zero out the accent suit you know back to an origin um we had solved that subsequently by putting a um a vive sensor on my arm mm -hmm. with a couple of you know satellites that could like keep me locked in place nice that's, um, that's one of the one of the ways we solved that and now to move on to the uh you know the topic of this meetup which is unreal um what can you tell us about the workflow you had? What versions of the engine have you used? Which one did you feel uh, was pretty much the most suitable for your work so far? You know, any plugins maybe you used or anything at all that you want to share with us? Yeah. So look, we were we were we started this project in August of 2021. Okay. So what was you know what was real was 426, right? At at that time. Um, and uh, a, a very early preview of five, okay? Um, and then we did our previews through the fall of 2021, like I said, with the, with the rough takes. And, um, and then, our, and then our, our final capture sessions were in January of 2022. We let every director choose which version they wanted to work with. Some people worked in 426 because uh, it seemed the safest, right? Um, you, so you wouldn't get Lumen, you, you know, you, you, you'd be rendering a, 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 a kind of a different pipeline, right? Some people decided they wanted to jump straight to five. Mm -hmm. Romeo 615 videos. We've got this awesome New York City cop episode. Uh, he was in five from the get go. He was like, I'm just diving in. We're going to go for the lighting and we're going to do this. You know, like it was a little scary. And then some people jumped into five, four, uh, four, two, seven, right? Which that was the most scary to me because you couldn't, at that time, you couldn't migrate from four, two, seven to five. You had oh, yeah. to stay four, six. So you know more about this than I do. You know, I, I know enough to get in trouble and how to, you know, work with people who are smart. Um, so we were working in all three of those platforms uh, simultaneously. And then everyone was coaching and helping each other through this process. Um, and then the bodies, uh, look, the, the, the metahuman bodies at that time were fairly terrible. The shoulders would always get screwed up. Um, you know, there were just, so we were using different bodies for different clothing sets and then taking metahuman heads and putting them on those bodies. And there were various strategies that we had to use. Did you did you connect it to the base of the neck? Did you connect it higher up? Because we didn't want to have to have collars, 
you know, that was like, you could hide all the garbage. Um, but, uh, you know, we're like, we, we're not gonna, we're not gonna hack that. We're gonna make it work. So everyone experimented and started finding things out. And what was beautiful about it was, it was 10 directors. Everybody got to share their insights with each other and kind of rise the tide for everybody. So some people would dive into each other's episodes and do little bits of handiwork for each other. It was really kind of a beautiful thing in that this project, the common theme of these stories is belonging. But what it really did also was create a sense of belonging for the community of creators um, inside of it. So that's a little bit about the platforms. Um, if you want to ask me something specific about a pipeline, I mean, I could just talk on and on and on. So you direct me where you want me to go. Sure. No, um, that makes sense. Um, I'm, I imagine there was a variety of uh, hardware specs its director was using, its person involved in the project was using. What would you say your uh, hardware specs were? Yeah, so we used in 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 my home studio. Um, the the uh, we've got a uh, a Threadripper thirty nine ninety X, and uh, I was able to get a hold of a thirty ninety, you know, first gen uh, as part of a build. Um, two two fifty six gigs of RAM eight terabyte solid state drive water cooled you know i was like i don't want the technology to be our bottleneck we have too much work to get done to have that be the problem so that's what we used in the studio during all the capture yeah makes um, sense. and um because we had it was too it would be too dangerous of a pipeline to lose 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 data you know we're pulling off of the suit at uh, 240 frames a second and the gloves, you know, the the helmets, we used two different helmets. Um, one was a face wear Mark IV and one was a custom helmet that standard deviation made for us. So we're going in, uh, you know, with a lot of data simultaneously. And we just didn't want that to be the thing that ruined it for us. Makes sense. Um, the, uh, and and that mostly worked, right? We we ran into some Wi-Fi issues. One of our suits we ran wired when one suit was wireless, and sometimes the gloves, two different gloves, depending on which order you turn them on. We had people like one actor's hands were on the other actor's body, and you know, figuring out how to turn everything on in the right order was kind of like really delightful. Um, and uh, in one take, uh, the the take that we liked best of Richard the Second. I, I, I fall to the ground wailing over the loss of my, my kingdom and, uh, and I lay on my back and knock the battery out of my battery pack out oh. right at the end of the take. It oh. was like, we couldn't have been better timing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, it, all, it never fails. Whenever you want technology to not fail you, that's exactly when it will fail you. Right. But we had great support from all of those companies. You know, they were on call, ready to help us with any problems. Um, you know, just wonderful people, wonderful companies. Yeah. Um, and as far as audio is concerned, what kind of hardware did you use? Like, what kind of microphones? What was your uh, what was your workflow for the audio guys out there? You know. Yeah. So um, just like in, so we kind of kind of ran it like um, a film, right? So there's a, a, a lapel mic, a Sennheiser uh, MK2 hanging off like a little um, deep sea light on a fish, right? Um, that uh, was always on the body, capturing close. Um, and that does a phenomenal job of capturing great quality. But we also had a boom, which would be our primary source because I have a fairly uh, uh, deep voice. And uh, even with, you know, a thousand dollar lapel mic, you're not going to get the richness that you can pull with, uh, you know, with like a, a 416 Sennheiser boom. Uh, so we, uh, you know, ran around with a boom, just like in a film shoot. And so we doubled, we always had double, double audio. Um, and you could jump tracks if you needed to, if there was a little scuff or something here and there from one to the other. Um, 
and that audio all ran through a Mac um, in Logic Pro for multi-track capture. Um, now the 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 sync, like you know, when you're shooting on film, you use a slate, uh, and, and these days the slates are all digital. So you're getting your time code to sync your audio, your visual, your multiple cameras. Um, we were not using a digital slate. We were using, we got this tiny little slate that we could fit right in between the arms of the, uh, the helmet uh, mount. Uh, but the other, the, the important thing was we needed to sync the face, we needed to sync the body, and we needed to sync the audio and then the cameras because we have wild cameras for you know if, if if there's any kind of hand keying cleanup you need to have all the video reference so the way that we did that was uh, something that corey williams had come up with was um we'd be facing uh the camera each of the wild cameras could capture us um get everything running and then uh, we do a slate and after the slate um, the actor would stand, hands out, and we go, pa, pa, pa. So we could get, then you take all of your data points and you get that pa, that accentuation on the face, lined up with the suit, with the clap, and the audio. And it was a perfect way of getting every track of every type of media to be synchronized. Interesting process, yeah. Um, what would you say is the, uh, in your opinion, the future of all this technology. What do you think the next steps are in this? Well, um, you know, as actors, there's no real, well, I would say the acting part is not very different. But, but the difference is that you don't, like if you're shooting, like we don't really know where the camera is going to be, right? <laughs> so it's kind of like theater in the round. Hmm. Um, uh, you have to perform as if it's just the world. So it's not like if you're shooting on film, you've got a wide as an establishing shot and you can make larger movements. And then you do a medium shot and you can do a little bit more. And then you do a close where nothing moves, you know, just you're expressing maybe a little bit of something, but not very much at all. So that's how we're, you know, have we have to work for camera. Um, but for performance capture, we don't know. So you kind of have to do a blend of those things because the editing may take place after the fact. Um, now, my preference is if the cinematographer has a shot list and they know how they want this to go together, we know what's going to be wide, we know it's going to be close, and then you can kind of work the performance to match that. Um, you know, video game cutscenes you know, maybe you get that, maybe you don't get that, right? Um, and I see this is, um, you know, Andy Serkis is a huge, you know, hero to me, you know, in promoting this work as not different. Um, and it's, and, and it's, it's not just because acting is acting, but because we are not our own bodies anyway, right? Like, this is what Myron looks like, right? We say that. This is what Eric Bear looks like. But this isn't Eric Bear. This is the body, right? I mean, we could cut off my hand, cut off my arm, cut off my legs. Eric Bear isn't diminished. But this vehicle that carries my consciousness around might be changed, right? You can cut your hair, you can put on different clothes. It's no different in the metaverse or in performance capture. You're just wearing a different skin. So if you do the work of separating your attachment to your body anyway, this is not me, right? Then the beingness that we portray, it doesn't matter if it's on camera or if it's on performance capture, the beingness is what what comes through and people who look at these things and, and they're like, Oh, you can tell who the actor is hmm. because that's how they are. Right. It's, it's not the skin. It's the, it's the beingness that comes through. So I think we have phenomenal potential, uh, which is a great opportunity for actors and filmmakers to be able to create 
worlds where we are, you know, going in, and living in other dimensions, right? I mean, as a realm bender, we're already phasing in and out of different worlds and different histories. And so to be able to be, um, you know, not just large or small or a different racial mix or a different, you know, four, four arms, four legs, two legs, you know, the um, old, young, I mean, I play old people, young people, women, men, you know, we are so fluid that it allows us to become present in all of those ways. And, and it's phenomenally exciting. You know, what we could do for a really low budget building this series, you know, I think is phenomenal. We're kind of democratizing the creation of media. Like mm -hmm. anyone can build an Unreal Engine, it's free. Yeah. You know, you can make these meta humans for free. You can build assets, buy assets for cheap, and make these stories. Um, that is phenomenal. You know that anyone can do this, and that um, it means that it's not just the big ticket studios who are getting to play in the space, but the rest of us get to play in this space and. Um, you know, that's pretty cool. No, I totally agree with you. I mean, we see the same thing happening in the gaming industry for a while now, you know. Uh, Unreal Engine did start as a gaming engine after all. Yeah. And then, you know, at some point, once uh, Epic Games pretty much democratized the availability of the engine and the licensing of the engine, suddenly we had this explosion of creativity in the gaming industry. And now I start seeing the same effect take place in the filmmaking industry and you know that's phenomenal i mean as you said right now anyone that is willing to learn a couple of uh you know technical uh learning curves sometimes they're a little bit steep but overall the resources out uh, they are out there you can learn all those things you can just unleash your creativity and start coming up with some really high quality content which before there was no way you could do that right it's um Brings me to the point now, to the question. Um, when is uh, Belonging Season 2 coming up? Well, um, we got to get Season 1 out first, right? So we've been, we've been kind of making our way around the festival circuit. And we've had uh, different episodes playing in different places. You know, we've won some Best Animation at um, Toronto Women's Film Festival, Paris Women's Film Festival. We've... Uh, kind of headlined at the, the, the Detroit Black Filmmakers Festival. And, and here uh, this Saturday is the first time anywhere we're, we're playing the entire season end to end, all 10 episodes, um, which is pretty exciting. You know, very few people, you know, just some family and friends have, have seen this. So this is the first time we're taking it out to, uh, to, to an audience to be able to see it like that. Um, and we'll continue to take it to some festivals um, and start exploring, you know, what our options are for, for a streamer to pick it up um, nice. so that we can really maximize. And then what we do with season two is unknown. You know, it could be that we take some of these and we turn them into their own, you know, mini series uh, or, or we bring on another set of 10 directors to make a whole bunch of, new things with more actors um more i mean we use i was i started in every one of these it, it, we were under quarantine you know it was that's, that's not how i want to work um but it's what we were able to do you know so more actors uh and uh, and longer longer episodes i mean it's very much like uh love death and robots but with heart yeah. right i mean we're they've gone very dark and it's beautiful and super inspiring and we have connection and uh and you know kind of emotional diversity was our intent you know as our, our our approach have you also considered maybe the possibility of opening up to the community and allowing more creative people to get involved whether it's you know uh, could be character modelers uh, environment and prop artists lighting artists you know Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we've had in, in this first season, we have reached out to, you know, we, we have particular challenges 
uh, for example. Um, and so we brought in, you know, environmental specialists to go build out and do lighting and set up, you know, for, for an episode to, to help out. And then we'd have somebody who was really great at building, you know, costume waiting to come in and do a thing. Um, I think with a, with a larger budget, we could have more people and more specialties bringing it, you know, for exactly that kind of richness. And last question from my end. Um, have you considered submitting the project for the Unreal Mega Grants? We have, and we are waiting for an answer. Oh, okay, yeah, we've all been in that boat. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for uh, answering all my questions, Eric. I really appreciate that. I mean, you guys have done a great job. You know, it's definitely one of the best examples I've seen out there using all those uh, different things, you know, the meta humans, Unreal Engine, the motion capturing, accents, and Manus gloves, you know. So, and of course, most importantly, the talent and the soul you put into this. I mean, it's pretty evident in my opinion. So, uh, you know, thank you for sharing all that with us. Oh, thank you. Your words are very kind. Yeah, great, great questions, uh, Myron. And thanks again, Eric. So uh, before we move on to the next section, uh, we'll open the floor to questions here. Uh, from the audience and I'll put you on screen as well. So I uh, just unmute yourself and I'll also add you to the spotlight. Um, and just on deck, so you know, uh, Chris, uh, Winwood Spot, uh, if you and Art want to talk about NFTs uh, later on tonight with Eric, I know during our pre-call, Eric mentioned he wants to do NFTs. And then Paul, if you can turn your camera on or if you don't want to, it's fine too. We'll talk about acting or the... Uh, acting process for motion capture and with Unreal Engine. So Leonardo, do you want to ask a question or Frank? Uh, you have to unmute yourself, Leonardo. Yeah, you're still muted. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, no, I, I more of a comment that I, I don't think you realize just how important what you did is from a historical perspective. Um, well, say more. Uh, for a very simple reason. I, in 2019, went out to Hollywood um, with a film that I'm going to do or I'm, I'm doing, um, wanting to work with Unreal simply because of the nature of the project and everybody laughed at me. And I kept going back and pitching and everybody just keeps saying no. Hmm. Uh, and so basically, you know, the quarantine came and uh, I then started to, um, you know, work on my own and develop the project out completely in, in isolation. And I was reaching out to the Unreal uh, community here, but because it was quarantine, basically nobody was coming back. So it was complete hmm. isolation. Um, but everything that, that you've done is what I was saying to them that this had the potential to do. And, and they were basically just saying, no, and I'm glad that you went out and did it. You proved it. And I, I also like the fact that you did it from exactly the perspective that, that I was trying to get across to them that what this technology is about is really about capturing an inner performance in, in a very different way than cinema does. Yeah. This is a completely new form of, uh, it's a new art form. And, and, and people aren't realizing that yet. It's kind of like when you had the beginning of cinema where cinema was beginning to be defined as an art form. And there was, if you look at the early films and you read things like, you know, Andre Besman's thesis of what is cinema, you find that at that time they were still stuck in theater. And it, it, it took time for that language to evolve. And um, that, that's what's happening right now. We're, we're in the process of the evolution of a completely new art form. Right. And uh, that, that's what I've been focusing on. I mean, the film I'm doing is just one actor playing every, every character. Uh -huh. uh, and so it's, you know, um, the, the whole reason for it is that, is that you, what you said earlier, with this technology, one actor can be a child, can be a monkey, can be a horse and and that's something that that cinema and theater can't do not so easily no 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 not in the same way not definitely not in the same way yeah mm. 
yeah so yeah like i said i i really think that what you've done is extremely you know it, it's a historic uh these are the kind of things that at the moment they don't seem that way and then you look back on it and say oh wow that was <laughs> the moment that that happened <laughs> well that's cool i um I, that that it's it means a lot to hear you say that thank you yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to be there on Saturday. I'm going to go right. and, and I really want to watch the entire thing on a big screen too. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll talk anyway. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah. So for you guys who, you know, we're, we're screening the whole thing on Saturday at 1.30 at the Saver Cinema. And, um, and then there's a, re a Q and A reception afterwards. Um, it's going to be a really, uh, a really cool time. Yeah, on that note, let's uh, bring up the flyer here. Oh yeah, and I can I can drop the links into the um, into the chat. Here's the and this is the link to the uh, for the tickets. The tickets are normally $18 uh, for the for the screening and the reception, but you put in that code, which is case sensitive, um, and it drops it down to $5 and it's just for you guys. Um, and if you want to check out some of the uh, you know, the, the, the trailer and some of the behind the scenes on some of these things. There's a link to the Hyperwatt website. Um, yeah, we'll we'll, uh, we'll send that out to everyone. And then if anyone who's watching the live stream, they can just uh, screenshot this right here. And those are the handles to, to track on Instagram and Facebook and whatever. <laughs> Great. Um, so Paul, um, are you ready with, uh, your questions? Uh, yes, of course. Um, first of all, that was like enlightening, you know, you are far ahead of the trend, my friend, and it's an honor to see this work of art. Mm. Um, you know, uh, as an actor, I, I haven't done, uh, much acting in the past. I've done more of metaverse development. But instantly, I could I could align with what you're talking about because as an actor, I, I started uh, development with metaverses because of acting. You know, I recognize that we as actors we put ourselves in uh, different people's shoes, and you know, for us it's like a, a way to expand our our tools of the method, right? Of being able to change who we are and being able to live other lives. And virtual reality is, of course, it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a medium that that touches and not. So I just want to ask you a few questions. Uh, what, what genres do you think are going to start popping in this kind of new format, this new uh, art? Like, do you see comedy, horror? Like, what do you think is going to be something that, that people will be drawn to, if anything? Well, look, I mean, that's, a, that's kind of an economics question, I think, more than an artistic one. Um, you. you know, we know that uh, historically, new technologies um, are going to make their biggest initial hit in pornography. Um, you know, like it or not. Um, uh, uh, and then, you know, action and horror. I mean, look what happened to Love, Death and Robots from season one to season three. Yeah. Darker and darker and darker, um, which made me sad, you know. Um, I, I enjoy the art of it, but as a, as an audience, it doesn't make me feel good. Um, and I'm not saying like, I only like to watch, you know, romantic comedies, but, um, you know, the, the whole range of emotion is what is cathartically interesting as an audience. Um, and so look, action is really hot these days. I think where we get to, um, You know, quality emotional expression. Look, you know, Andy Serkis as Caesar in Planet of the Apes. Powerful, powerful acting work. Um, like, we can now do that for a tiny fraction of the cost. 
the, the performances in the Avatar films um, have emotional resonance. Um, but, you know, so it's going to take a little bit for, I think, drama to, um, to make its way in, in large part because this is being driven from tech as opposed to from heart, right? That it's just a different driver of where the tech goes. And I think that's what makes belonging kind of unique in that way. So, um, you know, if I can encourage quality dramatic writing and quality dramatic performances, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty interesting. I mean, metaverse is also very interesting to me, Paul. Um, not because I think it's interesting to live in the meta metaverse. Um, you know, I was in the early waves of VR in the 90s, right? And we tried and we spent a lot of money trying to make money and it just flopped and it flopped. And, you know, we kind of see these waves. But what's interesting to me as, um, as a human being and as a Buddhist is that what happens in the virtual reality metaverse experience where you wear a different skin is that we're able to separate our skin from ourselves like i was talking about before and then we come back to this fiction of reality right and we're not attached to it so much it doesn't bear the weight of being so critically real right and then we get to experience this, <laughs> this version of reality as a skin it's a metaverse also and then there's something that happens in our connection with one another and the humanity and our lack of separation. I kind of start to experience people like fingers on a hand. You know, we surface like this and we seem like separate individuals, but we're really made out of the same stuff underneath, you know. So I think there's for me, there's hope of interconnection and dropping conflict um, and possibilities that come from that. You're muted. We can't hear you, Paul. My bad. Absolutely. Uh, amazing and uh, really inspiring. Um, how do you see yourself? Uh, how do you see audience uh, in the future uh, interacting with the story element? Do you see the audience being drawn more into the story? Is that a factor you want to bring in? Well, so, you know, it's pretty interesting. And we had this talk about the, the syntax of the development of the cinematic language right um <clears throat> going from silent film uh to you know in black and white to adding sound to adding color um and 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 richness and you know realism and there's this kind of interesting dynamic which we see um in, in a way we want to keep audiences engaged which means not having you want kind of progressive disclosure. Like, why is lingerie sexier than just being naked, right? There's no progressive disclosure with just being naked. There's something about like not having, and then your imagination gets engaged. Um, so why are black and white photos more compelling a lot of times than color photos? because now the viewer's imagination is doing some work. We've got skin in the game as a co-creator of the emotional experience. I feel like that's important. Um, now, uh, I just read that Ryan Reynolds is working on a, um, uh, a version of, um, oh, the, the video game, what's it called? Um, I mean, he did Free Guy, but no, no, no. But there's a there's a there was a video game that we played in high school, um, uh, uh, Dragon Slayer. Oh, Dragon Slayer, yes. Of course. Yeah, um, and they're and they're coming out with a, a live action version, but there's also going to be interactive, um, right? So interactive gives us a lot, right? Because now we've got skin in the game, in that sort of way, um, which is pretty interesting. You know, actually, and, that that's actually a good choice for a, a title. That's remember, Dragon Slayer had the laser disc, right? The giant yeah, yes, it was. Phonograph laser disc. It was interactive live cuts of the animation. 
everything. Everyone thought that was, it was awesome. brilliant. I mean, and you had to, you had to make those moves right at the right time or else the disc wouldn't jump at the right time. And you would, you're constantly dying. Yeah. Um, great. That, that's, that's a great example of an early interactive experience. Like we were talking about, um, Last question, um, but I could go on all night. Like, this is amazing and enlightening. Uh, how do you see, you said you got like a few, a bunch of directors to work on this one uh, particular cinematic project. Do you see that as a norm in the industry in the future of, you know, this kind of like cross collaboration between creators and different type of uh, characters and actors remotely across the world? Um, is that a leading question? Yeah, um, well, of course. Yeah. So look, we already have that in TV, right? You watch, um, you know, uh, uh, Strange New Worlds or Picard or This Is Us or, you know, whatever your favorite uh, TV show is. And you'll notice that there's different directors um, with most episodes. Sometimes they do it in a block. In 1883, we had like a director do three episodes and a different director do three episodes and another one do, you know, a couple of episodes like that. Um, you know, what was important to me in belonging was that uh, 10, different, 10 different episodes, different genres, different e emotional character, and 10 different directors. So they're different styles, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, what, you know, one person's view of the world, you know, and another person's view of the world and their sensibilities about the passage of time or how light plays in the space or where you put the focus um, <clears throat> is so different. And that's really wonderful that like you just get to see so much of that richness. Um, and, and I love that about TV today is that you can have a consistent set of characters, but you get a different script, script writers and different directors and it keeps it really rich um, and diverse like our population. Absolutely. Um, one more question, I'm just curious. Uh, you say you're, you're, you find the metaverse interesting. How do you see um, the metaverse coming along with the development of these cinematic uh, tales? Well, a um, cu couple ways, right? Um, one is, there's this is like a prototype of practice of what it's like to be in parallel universe right for us as actors or as a um a mocap director in the volume we don't see that world right um the way that we shot belonging we weren't looking at the previous world simultaneously i've done other things i was in a short um Darth Vader versus Master Chief, in, uh, in, and, I, and I played both of those guys. But what happened was I was working with a director in Vancouver and um, we took my XSense data, piped it over a VPN to his machine, and then he fed over OBS his computer's rendering back to me. So I could, and then, um, we actually used a, uh, put a, put a, an iPhone in front of my face mounted with the camera. And I was looking at the rendering from Unreal Engine right in front of me. So as I looked around, I'm looking at the world that I'm in instead of the volume, right? So I'm like, kind of like a VR helmet, but a little bit of hacky with a remote <laughs> end to end loop going on. Like that is um, phenomenal. And, and what happens there when you can get real time feedback is it tells you where your body posture, you know, like where, how am I holding my head? I see my Darth Vader's helmet is now different. Or if I were to swipe my hand, I could hit the cape and I could see the cape move, which would then make it feel in that arm as if I touched the cape, even though there was no actual cape there. It's just amazing illusion of reality that takes place, you know, we our senses, we start to feel like it's real. So I think that work that we're doing here in, in creating cinema and figuring out how to do it in a way that brings that um, world to life so that we have to not project so much, you know, like, like 
tell me where am I seeing my burning castle? Like I just need to know where to look that I'm seeing my burning castle. We can actually see the burning castle. That changes it. So I think there's a there's a roadmap to metaverse uh, for you know for every everybody. So wow. what's that screen called when you do when you do it? I know like with Myron, I know he's in a. I guess you, Eric and Myron, are both in bands. Like you know when you have that that one speaker just for the uh, the band so they can hear it themselves. Uh, what's the that? Yeah. yeah. The mo- what's it called? Monitor. monitor. So so what's an, what's an app term we could like. Tr- hashtag for the metaverse aspect which you just described seeing yourself yeah yeah it's your virtual monitor i mean it's the it's the world it's your meta um meta monitor meta monitor that's a good hashtag (laughs) um sorry i can't resist um how do you see ai coming along what do you see an ai character in a film let's say interacting with, with a real actor well, I'll tell you where AI is really helpful in crowd scenes. Um, you know, you want mass multiples. Um, you know, so, so in that uh, Darth Vader versus Master Chief, I, I played a bunch of stormtroopers. I played like six or seven stormtroopers. So we'd like do a bunch of loops of like, okay, this guy has got a wounded left leg, so I have to walk like this. And he's holding this kind of gun and the other guy's holding this and everybody's doing this and you're going to turn to this guy. So I'd like, you shoot all those in sequence and you throw them together. Like that's a great place for AI. You know, um, you, you take, uh, um, some movement sequences, you develop some rules around it. You say, what does it mean to have a left injured leg? Where's your limp going to be? Um, and you know, there's a place I'm not worried about taking away actors jobs. Um, I'm not really interested in AI being used for the the replacing emotive performances. Um, but I do like it for crowd work. I also like it for face mapping. Um, you know, there's phenomenal work being done uh, on, you know, even with just a still image of the representation and you can map that onto another performance. Um, so I think there, there, there's, um, you know, that gets greatly accelerated when you've got, um, you know, even with just one camera, you do two cameras for stereoscopic or you use an iPhone to, uh, you know, to, to, to throw a thousand dots on a face. And now you've got actually a 3d model in real time reading. Um, so there's a nice place for AI for intelligent mapping. All right, thanks. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you. Um, that's are all, that's all my questions. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks, Paul. And if you got, you know, follow, you guys can always follow up and, you know, DM me on Instagram and i um, glad to chat more. Or I'll come to the show on Saturday and we'll talk in, in this version of reality. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think... We'll we'll play the trailer one more time, but we'll also wrap up with a, a, a brief NFT talk. Uh, but let me play the trailer again, and then talk, and then give the on screen about the uh, discount codes for for Saturday. You guys see the screen? Yes. All right, great. Let's see. Actually, we're seeing your desktop, not the browser. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why I thought, yeah. It's one of those Zoom things, huh? Be sure the exact uh, screen is. It's always good to clean your room before you show a Zoom. Yeah, I know. There you go. All right, so so this this time before I play the trailer, uh, Eric, why don't you introduce the actual uh, the different shorts? Um, I mean, the different uh, episodes. Yeah, you bet. Okay, so and they're not in this order in the trailer, um, but uh, this is the order that they're going to play when we do the string out on Saturday. Um, Night is a Eugene O'Neill piece. Um, 
uh, directed by uh, Corey Williams and um, uh, and uh, Becky Cooper. And uh, Water uh, is a dramatic piece between uh, two people who are dating about, you know, an issue of having kids or not having kids. Um, that's also directed by Corey Williams. Um, here is a coming out story uh, between a father and a son on this beautiful drive along the Mediterranean, um, directed by Nick Tushishin. Um, Duck is, uh, is, takes place in Arkansas on the boat I was talking about. Christina Mercado directed that one. <clears throat> Partners takes place in New York City. It's uh, uh, an abuse of power. Um, and we're looking at um, kind of the experience of Black America, directed by Romeo 615 Videos. Um, Web, Web Pickersgill directed um, Trust, uh, this uh, corporate successful guy and the relationship with uh, his, his partner's son. Um, so entrepreneurial situation. Uh, Rosaline is a uh, is a reimagining of a Shakespeare piece, um, Love's Labor Lost. And uh, we've fast forwarded it to take place in uh, a long, long time ago in the same setting as uh, Podme's Royal Suite from Revenge of the Sith. It seemed fitting that his pining over Roseline would be where. Um, Padme is pining over Anakin and taking Shakespeare into outer space just seemed the right thing to do. Um, directed by Luke Hill. Uh, fiction is a Tennessee Williams piece, uh, Lady of Larks Per Lotion. It's one of his very first pieces um, directed by Solomon Jagwe. He's, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys follow him on Motion Capture Society. He does a lot of great work. He has um, some really good content on YouTube, yeah. Yeah, and Nick Jashushin, I mean, you guys would know him. He's Professor Pixel at Drexel. He does a lot of great tutorials. He's, an, you know, an authorized um, Unreal Engine uh, educator. Um, uh, Fred Junkira directed Fire as an original script. Um, Fred also did all of the facewear uh, retargeting and calibration and um, hand keying tuning of, of the faces across the episodes. Um, that's a, a moving piece between uh, a brother and a sister and a father working in a law firm and, you know, talking about following the heart. And then Farewell is a, uh, is a reimagining of uh, Richard II uh, Shakespeare piece in just this phenomenal cinematic world that we've never seen Shakespeare like this before. Lance Mungia just bit off a monster approach in the physics of the world and, you know, the, the, the um, gravity painting of all these suits is just un unbelievable. So there's the 10. Nice. Now I'll play your trailer again. And, uh, Well, here's a memory for you. We either fold or we double down. I want you to have the world, Emma. But please, not kids. I'll do anything else you want. Go to. It is a plague that Cupid will impose from my neglect of his almighty dreadful little mind. Oh, don't be afraid. I'm just a friendly officer here with some friendly advice. Make dust our pain. And with rainy eyes, write sorrow upon the bosom of the earth.
suppose my books fell short of their final chapters. And even my verses languished uncompleted. Out here in the middle of nowhere, we didn't even speak the language. You find a guy to break your heart. Water real still. Fog hanging low. I became the moon and the ship in the dim star sky. I belonged. Yeah, so the uh, some of these sections I know you talked about, like here's the uh, like it's the finger tracking, <laughs> right? Was, was there was the music like? Uh, so I mean, obviously, you know, you're you're playing in real life, and the virtual person was playing, but was it one for one, or was how was that? How did that actually work? Yeah, well, we knew what the soundtrack was, so I I played you know my acoustic bass along with the soundtrack and then the, and that gave us the hand movement that, that went to the cello nice and then here i know you you uh the boat the boat yeah the boat yeah. that was pretty cool cool right the rocking of the boat <laughs> and then uh so you had sensors the force too you had the one sensors. with the force was pretty cool too with uh richard the second oh yes yes where is that there you go yeah um back a little bit where you can see like them. when you get off the horse that's 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 really brilliant oh yeah 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 because it's all just it's like physics it just is what it is you know nice um yeah so i guess so t- just to uh segue into uh art basel now and nfts you yeah, know this is the biggest we, time but, but yeah. before we do that just one correction i want to make i said um becky cooper was the co-director of Night, and I conflated two people. Becky Miller is is the, is our associate producer who kind of managed the whole process through this, and Jackie Cooper was the co-director of Night. Just want to make sure the credits are credits are stated properly. There. Oh, great! Yeah, I'm sure they appreciate that as well. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, so I think you're you're actually here in South Florida at a really good time. This is actually the really busy time of year coming up for the um, the art industry, right? We have Art Basel. So Art Basel is very expansive now. It's moved beyond uh, traditional art. Now we have a lot of film festivals. We have a lot of tons of NFTs. Like last year, you know, people are joking around, only half joking, that Art Basel was like really NFT Basel, really everything was uh was all about nfts and uh and i think you're moving to a section now where everyone is getting into nfts that are more than just jpegs you know yeah. you know part of about you know creating that connection with the buyer any art is you're creating the story behind the art you know the story of the artist and i think what you just did here explaining your acting process and you know you know bringing your characters to life but also, um, even what Paul was mentioning too, like the AI aspect as well. So maybe we can do so a few, few thought experiments since you're a, a technologist, is how will we translate that to the art buying world for traditional art Basel uh, attendees, uh, either the buyers or the uh, artists? And how do we, we translate that to just generic uh, NFTs for things like Unreal Engine creators as well? So for example, you're talking about how maybe not giving away everything for free. Yeah. One of the things about NFTs is, is a way to like tokenize uh, groups of IP that you can actually use to collaborate with other, other creators. Like for example, one thing we do here in Miami is we have a lot of uh, murals, right? Just like you do in Austin, a lot of art murals. But what we do here is for those art murals, you know, we add music, we add animation, we add, um, you know, a lot of uh, additional layers and content like portals mm-hmm. and stuff too. So that gives people an opportunity to collaborate as a mural artist with animators, with musicians, just like you do in any video game, right? Video game filmmaking is a collaborative art. So I just want to go into that a little bit too, is like, yeah. how do we take what you've made with Unreal Engine and and uh, package that into together into 
what we generically would call NFT, which is kind of a very broad term, I think. Yeah. So I have some thoughts. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if we're ready for them. You know, that's the problem being an inventor is that, the, you know, the majority of things I think about, we're not ready for. And um, so we don't really know how to do it yet. Right. Um, but what I picture is, you know, there's, there's little moments in each of the episodes that are um, kind of memorable, uh, emotional little packages. Like it could just be a few seconds long, just a little arc of a thing or, or a, a portion of a sentence. Um, and, and what I would see is, you know, just like selling a frame of an original film, you know, at an auction house, um, you could say like, you can own that little bit of that expression, but the way we package it, it's, um, and this is just my fantasy, I mean, you guys figure out how we do it, right? Is you'd have one of these little um, desk holos, which puts that little piece on a loop. And, um, and it can only be owned by the person who did the highest to, to capture that magical moment. That's good. That's an interesting uh, point. Like just to give you a history um, of the South Florida, like filmmaker NFT scene is uh, we've done uh, like three NFT film festivals so far this year. A lot of those are like NFT aspects of, of an existing event. So one of those, one of those we did was, um, we did like a short film fest. A lot of these Everglades short films, you know, basically mm -hmm. an airboat and running around and stuff. Alligators jump out at you. But, but those are the NFTs. There were like five, six second segments, right? Right. Which is kind of like what you're talking about having yeah. a piece of the film, and that was good uh, at that point in time because that's all NFTs. You know, it's kind of advanced for right. that time as well. But I think uh, things are progressing beyond that now. Well, so, I mean, it's but it, because it's 3D, it's like it's you yeah, know, yeah, like, the 3D aspect as well. Yeah. But maybe picking out what Myron said earlier about like, are you, when you said you're open to having collaborators, right? And yeah, maybe yeah. not these films are already done, but in, in future projects too. So, for example, Art, um, who's on who's on the um, meetup right now as well, he has the world's first uh, car that was purchased with Bitcoin, right? It's mm -hmm. called the Bitcoin Prius. Okay. So one of the things I did, you know, we're, you know, he's part of the Miami blockchain center. And uh, one of the things we did was we created a render for like the a futuristic version of his, it's a Prius basically. Uh, we put like a, uh, the, the top gun Maverick version of that Prius. Nice. Right? So, uh, you know, it looks like, uh, so, so that's the type of thing where, um, so if he took his, his actual Bitcoin Prius is a real kind of celebrity type car and yep. put it in as a, thing in one of your short films right that's a way to oh, yeah 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 it goes both ways. That. yeah like any 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 developer type thing too you know like myron a lot of a lot of artists go into all these things too but if we could you know the, the great things about smart contracts is you know you can uh the smart contract itself can give out the royalties to each artist and even the resales right. as well right um yeah so um so and the other thing is, uh, I'm just putting this out there and then we'll open the floor up, is right now we're talking about still, you're, we're filming everything, but we're still showing it on the screen, right? The big screen. Yeah. The, what, one of the things that really stuck out, struck out to me was when, you, when you're talking about your Vader, um, Vader versus um, Master, uh, Chief. Master Chief, right? And you were kind of projecting yourself into Vancouver and vice versa uh, via your technology too. And that's really what, you know, one of our unicorns here, unicorn startups here is called Magic Leap. Yep. And I think that was their, their original version, not now they're all enterprise, but, but the original version when they're more consumer based was same thing. You bring, you bring the, your storytelling into your room or you, right. you go into that thing, but you're right. literally, it's more like the mix, mixed reality where your characters are interacting with your environment. So Maybe the, the robot could clean up the mess behind me, right? Right. Or the virtual mess. So, so I think that's interesting too. Like your King Richard, your horses, your your, mm -hmm. your things too. Like putting that in your environment and but yeah. having interactive too. Like the, the dragons there. So, I'm wondering um, 
yeah, maybe just open it up now um, for that. I'm literally getting questions from the audience on text, I guess. So from the oh, watch. Oh yeah, so, I'm, I'm, from I'm, I'm, they, 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 they can they can I think they 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 realize eventually that I'm not monitoring. I should have been monitoring the chat on the live stream, but I haven't been. <laughs> so I'll ask some of these questions too from the chat as well. But great, I'll, great. Well, I'll just like let you answer and let me just go parse through these questions. Well, look, I mean, you know, uh, Apple has done a phenomenal job with ARKit. And, um, you know, the developer, developer community that's playing with ARKit is doing some really cool things. Um, because, uh, uh, because of the LiDAR sensor, you know, we've got uh, data on the planes. So we can now take virtual characters and place them with, you know, being obscured properly in, the, in this physical reality with other other elements and 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 they can be brought in so you know i think um w when we get to a place where we've got you know uh, uh normal weight glasses right or contacts um which sounds ridiculous but it's obviously going to come sometime right and now you can drop these virtual objects and characters into the perceived world um, that starts to become uh, really rich if it's not overrun by advertising. Yeah, yeah, advertising. So it's, yeah, and uh, Paul, I know you're building a uh, virtual mall, I think. It was, uh, yeah, so yeah, that's all I really wanted to bring up. Um, you guys can jump in as well. Um, but Myron, what do you, what do you think about actually the, the concept of uh, the collaboration between the artists um, being through NFTs um, itself? No, I think there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of possibility there. Of course, you know one thing I as a game developer have to be uh, cautious about is mentioning NFTs because in the gaming industry, you know the audience is a little bit not as receptive. But yeah, overall, that's why we always add. NFTs at the end, right? So you don't trigger people at the very beginning. Of the <laughs> but, you know, overall, if people open up their minds and uh, look into the available technology and the possibilities and they start thinking outside the box, I think there's a lot of stuff that can be achieved. So, you know, I'm always in favor of never dismissing something, just trying to look into it, even if you don't agree with it necessarily from the start. And then, you know, see how you can actually not only understand the point of view from the other side, but also how you can implement or incorporate this thing into whatever you, it is you're doing. So I think we're living in a very interesting time with everything going on right now, whether it's the, the NFTs, the uh, AI, whether it's, you know, everything happening right now with uh, technologies like Unreal and motion capturing and everything else. So I think we are starting to see a future where everything uh, starts merging together and while I can understand why a lot of people are kind of against that I think it's also very good because at the same time we are all creative people right and we're all bringing together different perspectives as uh, Eric was saying earlier you know it's it's like the fingers you know you see only the we we see only the tips of the fingers but at the end of the day they're all connected by the palm so I think that's what all those technologies actually will help us achieve you know they will start connecting our different perspectives, our different creative uh, capabilities. And eventually I think something good will come out of all this. Yeah, so I think there's I a, um, I was gonna say, you know, there's this, uh, there's this moment in Westworld when Dolores uh, turns to Bernard and, you know, and they're like, is, is this now, right? Is this now? Um, and she says, um, you know, how do you know what's real? Hmm. And Bernard says, um, real is what's irreplaceable. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, I think a lot of good literature also is real while pop culture isn't as much. You know, those characters are part of your life. Um, but uh, yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, with uh, which, what you brought up earlier, Eric, about uh, who actually directed in, and uh, you know, temporarily misspeaking about who directed what, that might be a good use case of um, blockchain NFTs too, is 
giving actual credit to each artist, especially, you know, in a short film when there's no real theatrical release per se. So you are working for credit um, and having that. And also with my, which you're talking about the finger, the fingering of the, the cello itself, you know, I'm not, I can't do that, but he, Eric did that. So if I wanted to, to license that for, from him in my short film or my game, you know, that, uh, that capture of the finger, that would be uh, an interesting thing too, as opposed to like, um, you know, in a type of uh, uh, NFT store type setting too, very easy, licensable. And, uh, and later on, it can be verified too, if I, you know, I can't just randomly give that same motion capture to, to another game developer because on a blockchain, it can all be tracked who's using what. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually pretty interesting. Um, I've got a friend in London, uh, Ace Rule, who does a bunch of creature work. And he's developing kind of creature patterns that people can license and then use yeah. in use in their use in their work. Um, but attaching attaching them to blockchain for um, uh, you know authenticity and uh, compensation uh, kind of rights is is a pretty interesting way of. Um, creating an economy of artistic contribution, which is pretty darn interesting. Yeah, and so we have a guest here, Art, um, if you wanna unmute yourself. He, he hosts one of the uh, largest uh, uh, Art Basley type uh, NFT conferences down here. I don't wanna say the name, hey guys. or a profanity type name. How are you? Yes, it's very profane. Um, yeah, it's right a on. crypto uh, meetup that occurs Every year during uh, the Bitcoin conference, and it's kind of like a fun, anti-serious sort of show. And there's a lot of people who come out, like a couple thousand, and there's awesome speakers and parties and stuff it's fun cool yeah it's mostly pertaining to crypto and uh, and if space well didn't we all get beat up today yeah i didn't in art uh in art also the person <laughs> yeah, i'm not holding you know. anything at this time <laughs> right <laughs> so art what do you think about that you know i know you're the you're the bitcoin prius guy you know, you did the yeah. auction and stuff. Oh, so what did you think? What did you learn here today? And how would you be able to use that for your Bitcoin Prius and also for um, your, your conference? It's pretty cool. Uh, for the Prius, I'm not sure how I could. Maybe like um, doing some like commercial center. Everything's, I happen to be um, part owner of the first car that was ever purchased in crypto um and i'm planning on s s selling it later on uh, next year and we're talking to a mark hitting firm like to do videos and stuff so maybe we could like make some animated little promo like shots the reason, the reason I bring up that to their car, because it's, it's kind of a, a cult, a cult type thing, just like everyone knows about the Bitcoin pizzas, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, exactly I think like the that. Prius is the same thing. It's kind of a uh, celebrity type car type situation. Yeah. Like, almost yeah, like yeah. a celebrity in a film that Bitcoin Prius, the Herbie's in your car. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Give it a personality, man. Like Bumblebee. Yeah. But um, in terms of the conference side, that would actually be a cool to have like a live demo so so we have like a stage of speakers and stuff so it'd be cool to like have a live demo showing this kind of tech to the people because there's going to be a lot of people who who are very serious in the nft space and there's nothing stopping people from doing this kind of recording and then assigning a token to it and then selling the tokens and I mean, and you can show the video for free and then still monetize it. Right, right. So yeah. uh, that's an option. Cool. 
All right. So I think uh, the questions on the live stream were mostly answered, you know, through our yeah. normal thing. I think a lot of people are just inviting you to other things too. There's some bunch of things going on in New York City. I think that's a good thing about what Myron did is he promoted this under the Unreal Engine community. So people are watching from other other states now too. Great, great. So you'll share that with me. Yeah. We'll get that conversation going. Okay. And uh, any other questions from anyone here? Um, are, are we still going to be do, doing art Basel stuff, or is that a different meaning? I think this is like this is the start of our Basel now, you know, the film festival season. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We got to we got um, we to work our way into it, right? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, our Basel is a a whole season. Oh. Okay. Oh. Yeah, it's definitely Eric. You gotta come back for that. There's a you'll get no sleep though. So pre rest. When, when, it, when um, like I know that Miami Sci-Fi is sometime in the spring. Yeah. Maybe yeah this is more some more like this, this is more like end of uh, you know Thanksgiving time. End of end of November, beginning of December. Oh, like really yeah. soon. Yeah, okay. yeah, pretty quick. Yeah, or just I guess stick around. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, it was really delightful to be able to come here because my daughter just moved to Plantation about six months ago. Oh, okay, so this is your daughter's uh, house? No, no, I'm in a hotel. She okay. lives She lives 15 minutes uh, walk away from here. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, I got to borrow her car. That was helpful. <laughs> nice. And, uh, yeah, so it's great. I get to get to see my kid and, uh, and do this film festival. That's great. Yeah. Meet you guys so you can... Uh, yeah, we can, uh, yeah you're 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 a you're a, lo you're a local now. So. <laughs> I would definitely appreciate you sharing the work and you know everything behind the scenes that you shared with us. It's really appreciated. I know there's a lot of people in the community that want to do those kinds of things. I agree with Leo when he said that you know you're writing history. So hmm. definitely want to thank you for sharing that piece of history with us. <laughs> well, hey, you know we're, we're it's like we're all in it together. I agree. Just doing different parts. And Leo, why don't you say the last word? Well, I mean, I just think that uh, one of the observations he made about uh, the love and robots, that it was getting increasingly darker. I think that that's one of the biggest problems there is right now is that there's a, for some reason, um, Hollywood is making a lot of very ugly films. We're, we're not making the beautiful films we used to make. And I don't know if maybe that's a comment on, on our culture at the moment, but I think that um, one of the things that we maybe can do is, is to push for, for more beauty. Uh, and certainly with what you've done, I think that that's exactly what, what I like the most about it. Um, that these are beautiful films, you know, with, with a message. Uh, and they're, I think the most important audience for me I mean, at least the project I'm doing is, is children. I think that that is really the target audience for all of this. Um, if we start there, then I think we're going to make some big changes. Uh, 